Hello, and welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley. You know, normally we, we're talking a lot about cannabis, but uh, we're going to switch over today, and we are going to talk about psychedelics. Because it seems, and I didn't really know this, but there's been a lot of uh, research being done now in, in psychedelics. And it, more than that, and which also surprised me, that the state of Oregon last year actually went ahead and uh, decriminalized small amounts of all drugs, including psychedelics. And which also surprised me was that the approval rating was 56%, and that was 2 million votes. And I'm, they must have done a very good bang up job in Oregon to get all of those people to come out and, and, and vote the way they did. Um, now, there have been a lot of studies now, I shouldn't say a lot, but more than ever, uh, that say that, that psychedelics uh, are one of the safest drugs for several in, illnesses and, and, and other conditions. And I remember, you know, years ago, uh, you know, when we talked about psychedelics, there would be somebody that had some ecstasy and they would try and get you to take some ecstasy and say, you know, good things are going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to tell you that I shied away from that and, and did not get involved in it. And, um, but it, it seems, because I was afraid. That's why I was really afraid. But maybe, maybe now will be the time that I'll, I'll try some. I don't know yet. But anyway, um, I thought that since we're going to be, uh, you know, talking about psychedelics, we should get somebody in the psychedelics community who could give us an insight of what's going on. And so we have today a woman named Betty Aldworth, and she's Director of Communications and Events at MAPS, as well as the Zendo Project. So at this point, I'd like to say hello to Betty Aldworth. Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley, Betty. Hi, Paxton. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Certainly. Okay. Uh, I would like you very much to tell us about what MAPS does, and I know it is a very important organization, as well as talk about the Zendo Project. So let's begin with MAPS. T give us a, 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 you know, not a brief, it doesn't have to be so brief, but give us, give us uh, some information about MAPS. Sure, of course. MAPS was established in 1986 by Rick Doblin, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization to explore the cultural, legal, and medical contexts for um, the benefit for, of careful uses of psychedelics. And um, today, what that looks like is MAPS, the organization, the 501c3, plus a variety of, uh, a handful of, plus a handful of subsidiaries working on research, education, advocacy, um, and all things related to the psychedelic ecosystem, except investment, um, monetary investment for shareholder gain. Um, we have a wide variety of interest areas and we are conducting education um, or hosting education on all different types of psychedelics. The Public Benefit Corporation and MAPS, the organization itself, are mostly exploring the opportunities in MDMA for PTSD, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. At MAPS, we're working on advocacy and education, making sure that people um, understand the potentials here, as well as defining the research directions and sometimes sponsoring studies. The Public Benefit Corporation, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of MAPS, is responsible for therapist training and drug development. So when MDMA does become a medicine, once it's approved by the FDA, we'll be manufacturing this, the drug itself, assuring that patients have access through equity programming and returning all proceeds to the work of the 501c3 nonprofit. In addition, with, with, um, uh, with the Zendo project, that's our outreach arm, where we make sure that we're providing education um, and safe space for people who are using these substances, right? We know that prohibition doesn't actually stop much substance use at all. Um, and so when people are at festivals 
and using these substances. Zendo Project has historically provided a safe space for them to turn a what some many people refer to as a bad trip, but we call a difficult experience, into an opportunity for growth and healing. So we provide a quiet, serene space and trained volunteers to help walk people through that experience. Of course, there aren't any festivals now, so I'm very excited to be able to preview that the Zendo Project is working on a handful of new initiatives to bring the work of the program into communities themselves. And do you want to mention some of the, the new, new things you're going to be doing? Well, I can't quite talk about any of them um, yet. Can't talk about the secret, okay? It is, but um, what? So, listen. One of the really cool things about the Zendo is that um, once you're Zendo trained, you're not just using those skills in that experience, right? You're not just using those skills when you're on shift as a volunteer. You actually become a better support out for people having difficult experiences, whether using substances or not, out in the world. So the, you know, 5,000 or so people who have been trained through Zendo are now just like better friends, better supporters, and better able to help people when they're having a difficult experience. So it goes beyond the, the, um, the yurt itself. Well, so I want to ask you, let's say I, I have a difficult experience. How would I get to, to reach the people at Zendo and say, I need help? How can you help me? I, I'm going through a bad time now. Sure. As of today, um, we, the Zendo um, volunteers are not currently available via telephone or something like that. But we are working on some new initiatives um, in partnership with the Fireside Project, for example. We will, on April 20th, um, excuse me, April 19th, rather, uh, we'll be launching a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week hotline for people having difficult experiences. So they can call in and speak with someone who's been trained um, in a training program that was inspired by Zendo and, and is partnered with Zendo. So there will be a hotline available very, very soon for folks having difficult experiences. But, and this is the piece I can't give a lot of details about, we're also working on developing trainings for people to receive online at home, um, as well as trainings for uh, those folks that might come into con might be more likely to come into contact with someone having a difficult mental health experience. And again, so many of these skills transcend the psychedelic experience. And when people are having tough experiences, what you learn as a Zendo volunteer is useful well beyond the psychedelic experience. Um, can you tell me about, um, well, I think it's a psychedelic renaissance. What's going on out there? Because it, it, it seems that uh, I just read in the Wall Street Journal a, a huge article uh, about all of this. So can, can you give us some, some details about what's going on? Sure. I mean, if we're going all the way back, um, I think it's important for people to understand that um, every civilization in recorded human history, except those in very um, in places where there are not plants that can be used for uh, psychoactive experience, every civilization across human history has used plants or some other um, some substance for psychoactive exploration, typically spiritual or growth oriented, but it's not a new thing, right? The psychedelic renaissance, while very real, isn't new. Um, let's skip all the way ahead to about uh, 80 years ago. Um, and in the mid 20th century, we saw the, um, the synthesis the, that in the mid 20th century, we saw that LSD and MDMA were synthesized for the first time and they were initially explored for therapeutic use. They were used as therapeutic aids. We have to own up to the reality that they were also used for some nefarious purposes, but um, primarily they were used for aids and therapy. But as it turns out, people also find them enjoyably, enjoyable socially, and the use of these substances 
rose uh, socially and, rec and what people refer to as recreationally rose in the uh, 60s and 70s, making them prime targets in the war on drugs. So despite the medical and, and therapeutic progress, uh, or promise rather, um, MDMA, LSD, and other psychedelics got wrapped up in the war on drugs, whether or not uh, we believe the um, quote attributed to Nixon about locking up um, you know, black people and hippies uh, and dissenters um, by using drug laws, we certainly can say that that is a uh, likely motivation there. So in the course of the prosecution of the war on drugs, many, much of the research stopped. But prohibition doesn't, again, stop people from using substances. It just makes it more dangerous. Um, when, you know, when we aren't offering education or support services. So the uh, substances have been used continuously throughout that time in the American social context, the global social context, but also in those traditional and, and indi indigenous spiritual uses. It wasn't until 1986 when my boss, Rick Doblin, laid out a strategy to make MDMA a medicine through approved clinical trials and the FDA process that we saw the reemergence of um, approved study of these substances. And, you know, at that time, uh, we were chuckling just yesterday, we're coming up on our 35th anniversary. Um, Rick proposed that it might take uh, five or 10 years for MDMA to be approved. However, Boys, bureaucracy, and its own adventure. <laughs> um, it's a trip, if you will. Um, we've been undergoing study for many, many years, um, approved clinical trials in, for about 20 years now. And we are on the precipice of filing that application to the FDA for approval of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy uh, for PTSD. And we're also seeing alongside it a resurgence in interest in psychedelics. You know, if you look at the history of drug consumption, no matter what drug you're speaking about, whether that's caffeine or alcohol or psychedelics or cannabis, there are patterns of use, you know, uh, um, increasing use over certain periods and decreasing use over others. And that has much more to do with social trends than it does anything else, um, or perhaps even global trade trends. Um, but what we are seeing right now is an acknowledgement that psychedelics might fundamentally change the way that we think about mental health conditions. Psychedelics might offer us a window into um, treating the condition, giving people the tools to work with the core of their issues of, that are causing these conditions, right? Whether that's PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, substance use disorder, all of these things are very much connected in terms of um, how they function as mental health conditions. And if we're able to, through uh, therapy with psychedelics as a catalyst, provide people with a new way of looking at um, the, the elements of their life that are causing them distress, we might be able to fundamentally shift how we're treating mental health in this, uh, you know, in this Western paradigm. Now, are you getting any calls like from psychologists or uh, even psychiatrists asking for, shall we say, training in this area? Uh, are, there, are there medical schools that are now uh, perhaps starting a course or two courses or something like that? Do you think there, and, and finally, do you think there will be a specialty in, in, in this area at some point? All of these things are already happening. It's extraordinary really? to see this develop, yes. There are multiple uh, training programs that are, that are, are out there now, um, including the training program provided by MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. We've trained hundreds of therapists in this protocol, and we will train thousands more, which is wonderful because it means that we can really make an impact. Eight million Americans are living with PTSD. It's going to take a lot of therapists to help that to help um, deliver this protocol, and and um, and to and maybe the therapists people. will need help. <laughs> 
also. Well, sure, right? I mean, therapists yes. are uh, not by any means uh, exempt from suffering from mental health conditions. Perhaps they have different tools, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are, our training program along with these others are a very important piece of this ecosystem. And what we anticipate seeing and what we're in fact seeing now is that clinics are developing a psychedelic assisted therapy specialty. So those who are already offering, which are already offering ketamine based therapies are signing up for training in MDMA assisted therapy. They are looking at psilocybin assisted therapy. And I think that what we'll see is that they are, of course, there will be therapists who are specially trained in one substance and modality. But I think that we will very commonly see clinics where people are able to engage in different types of therapies as is the best fit and recommendation for their condition, their health status, and their um, therapist's recommendation. Well, this is this is actually, you know, fascinating. And I'm just wondering, do you think there will be any changes on the federal level uh, now that we have Merrick Garland as uh, a, a U.S. Attorney General? Do you see anything happening, you know, on a, on a on a big scale? Boy, do I hope so! Right. So there are two things that we know are highly likely. As I mentioned earlier, MAPS is involved in uh, cannabis-related work. Um, we are releasing very soon um, on ca uh, smoked cannabis for PTSD. Um, but unfortunately, any study on cannabis in the clinical setting is going to be hampered by the NIDA monopoly. Um, the NIDA monopoly, uh, as we refer to it, is a regulatory and bureaucratic method by which the University of Mississippi is the only facility authorized to provide cannabis for research purposes. And because of that monopoly um, and the poor quality of the cannabis that's provided at, from the University of Mississippi, we really can't do meaningful study on cannabis for PTSD, for glaucoma, for um, you know, the side effects of cancer treatment for any of these things that your listeners are so familiar with that their patients have been reporting have been helpful over the years. However, MAPS has filed suit uh, against the DEA um, and the Department of Justice alongside uh, Dr. Lyle Craker at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in order to um, get the DEA to follow their own guidance and start issuing licenses for cannabis production. And if that happens, that'll, make, that'll mark a massive shift at the federal level in terms of cannabis for medical use that then can be validated through the FDA system and become a more common um, treatment for a variety of, of conditions that we already know it works for. It moves beyond the recommendation uh, for medical cannabis use and uh, allows us to start thinking about cannabis as a prescription. So that's tremendously exciting. Um, we also anticipate the introduction of several bills related to psychedelics again this year in Congress. And I think that the opportunity there um, is, you know, to educate many more members of Congress about the potential of these treatments. We're also and how looking... do you go about doing that? How do you go about doing that? Well, it's a it's a, a pretty basic function of federal advocacy, right, or, or of legislative advocacy. Um, with, it's the same thing that we have seen with the development of any um, any legal change uh, related to cannabis or psychedelics, which is that we we seek out lawmakers who are interested in pursuing, um, you know, the opportunities that these substances pr present or those who are, um, like so many Americans, horrified by the effects of the war on drugs. And we seek to provide them with information that they need about the potentials of these treatments and the other arguments in support of um, making legal changes. And so, uh, you know, there are some lawmakers uh, who have already introduced bills in the last Congress. We expect uh, that we will see that and more as the general public interest in this field of study becomes um, escalated. Now, the other interesting piece here is that um, 
we are seeking final approval for MDMA assisted psychotherapy studies uh, within Veterans Affairs uh, medical facilities. So for the very first time, we'll be hosting these studies in VA facilities themselves, which will mark a very significant shift in the um, the way that those are funded and or the, or the way that those studies are approached rather uh, for veterans specifically. But as many people know, the VA is actually the largest funder of PTSD research. Um, in the country, and so that work will benefit people living with PTSD, whether the index trauma is combat related or due to interpersonal violence or racial trauma. So uh, one final question, do you think someday uh, there will be uh, actually some colleges throughout the United States that will be specifically geared uh, to training uh, doctors in, in, in doing this kind of work. Uh, what, is, what do you think is, is the future, let's say, can we say 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, today, Ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Today we have psychedelic research centers at Johns Hopkins. Stanford has just opened up a research center. Um, I believe UCLA, NYU has hosted research. Uh, there are uh, UCSF. Um, in San Francisco. There are many different uh, colleges and universities, well-known uh, schools that have um, started to look at psychedelic therapies, but John Hopkins has long been the leader in that realm. Um, I think the, the, the definitive answer to that is yes. Um, there are also smaller schools, Naropa and the California CIIS, I'm afraid California that I just can't remember the root of something, something, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's um, good. You know, I wish we could spend more time uh, on this. And I, I'd love to have you back on, especially when maybe you uh, have, you know, some more research out there that you'd like to present. And can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about uh, MAPS, for, for example? Sure, absolutely. It's very simple. MAPS.org. That's M as in multidisciplinary, A as in association, P as in psychedelic, and S as in studies. Maps.org is a gateway to all of our information, including a compendium of psychedelic research and studies, um, information about what's happening uh, around all of these different substances, and very importantly, information about our health equity work in order to make these um, treatments available to people who otherwise might not be able to afford them or might not otherwise um, be drawn to the work. So I do hope that folks will learn more about us and consider making a gift in honor of our 35th, um, and uh, which is coming up in on April 8th, um, and supporting the advancement of health and healing for all. Oh, well, that's terrific. And, and we are going to promote that people uh, do give money to, to, to the organization. That would be terrific. And uh, it's been really wonderful talking to you. You certainly, I think, illuminated more about what's, what's going out there when it comes to psychedelics. And I think, I hope that there's some people who listen to our show who have been so-called anti-psychedelic. And by having you on, perhaps they've now become, shall we say, more pro-psychedelic. So, so I think that's a, a, a very important educational uh, thing that we've done today uh, with you. And I, I thank you for being on High Society with Paxton Quigley. And as I said before, we look forward to talking to you uh, again in the future. I can't so wait to come back, Paxton. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, this interview and all of our shows can be heard on paxtonquigley.com as well as on Apple Bot Podcasts and Audible and Spotify and Spreaker or wherever else you, you listen to your shows. And I'd like to also thank our listeners who purchased my latest suspense novel. It's called Just Try Me, and that's available on Amazon. And shall I say, please stay safe, wear a mask, Get vaccinated when your turn comes up, because as I say every week, we can beat this virus if we work together. I'm Paxton Quigley.